Good morning and welcome to uh, The Register. Uh, indeed, if it is morning, where you're tuning in from. I'm John Collins, your host. Now then, what are we going to talk about today? Throughout history, philosophers have tussled with some of the biggest questions of our time, struggled with some of these fundamental uh, ideas and uh, ideologies like, does God exist? Like, what is the meaning of life? Like, determinism versus non-determinism. But I'm sure we'd all agree that these questions pale into insignificance when it comes to the question of what is the difference between virtualization and cloud computing. And to help answer that question at this uh, webinar about uh, clouds for hire, I would like to introduce our panel. First of all, we have uh, Andy Buss from uh, Freeform Dynamics, our, our, our regular analyst uh, and uh, uh, welcome, welcome to Andy. Uh, uh, as you probably all know, he's a bit of a musician, uh, uh, and so he'll be uh, introducing the, the, base, the bass line for, for this particular uh, <laughs> webinar and keeping us regular. Keeping the tempo going. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Phil Richards um, of uh, Loughborough University. Uh, so as Dr. Phil, he'll, uh, he'll be able to diagnose and uh, answer all your <laughs> questions. So I would say uh, very early on, if you do have any questions about these very, very fundamental uh, uh, topics, then, then please do let us know. And more seriously, uh, Phil's going to give us uh, an insight into, into how this technology stuff actually works in the reality, in the real world of, of Loughborough. Uh, Chris Gabriel of uh, Logicalis. Now, uh, I understand, uh, Chris, uh, you haven't always uh, um, done such boring stuff as uh, just working for dull accounts like uh, uh, Ac UK Academia. Um, not that it's dull at all, might I say that very quickly. Where have you worked? Uh, but my, my only claim to fame as an account manager was uh, account manager for the Kremlin in, uh, in Moscow, but they did let me out, which was... Uh, which was good news. Clearly, they had nothing to fear from me. Apparently, they let you in very easily as well. They, they did. Clearly, uh, they, 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 let, they let the Welsh in and let them out as well, which is always good. <laughs> OK. And finally, uh, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence James of, of NetApp. Uh, and uh, Lawrence was, and uh, you couldn't make this stuff up, was formerly a weatherman. So who better to have on our panel about uh, cloud computing today? So why are we here? Why are we here? These are the questions that we are striving to answer. Uh, the agenda for today is very much about taking that technology of virtualization. Yes, we've all heard about it. Yes, we're all using it. But how can we uh, necessarily uh, see that as m just one element of, of the cloud? And uh, wh where, c where can we take it from there? I think that these are... Um, very much, it, it, it's not just about the virtualization, is it, when, when some people are talking about cloud computing. Um, we're going to be covering some lessons, we're going to be covering the opportunities, and very much we do, rec we do require your questions because we don't want to just sit here and spout off about stuff. We want to understand what you want to understand and we want to respond to that. So without further ado, let's pass over to Andy Buss, who's going to tell us about the viewpoint from the Reg readership. Thanks, Andy. John. And part of the reason why we're here today and talking about cloud comes out of a number of the studies we've done asking you, the Reg readership, about what you're up to. And most times what we get back is a lot of you have undergone a virtualization project and consolidated a lot of the workloads you've got. Um, but basically, when it comes down to it, what's beyond that? That's running IT in the old way, just using a consolidated set of infrastructure, but using old tools, old IT practices. And it makes IT more efficient, but doesn't really take it to the next step, which is really meeting a very dynamic set of change requests from the business as the environment becomes more difficult. So um, really what we see is now a number of companies looking at moving to a dynamic infrastructure. So that's moving beyond just pure consolidation, running apps the old way, but now being able to move them around the infrastructure, um, work out where it's best to run them, what the service levels are, spin up, spin down, and actually make best use of resources. Uh, in the latest surveys we've run, it's been about 10, 10 to 15% of you have actually done this in person, with perhaps another 20% planning this over the next 12 to 18 months or so. 
So it is becoming a burning question for many of you, and therefore it's important to get to the bottom of, well, how do we actually get started on this journey, and how do we make it real for us, and what are some of the learnings we can take away because of the, uh, the difficulties that are associated. This is not a simple thing to do, but what we do is we take complexity and we actually effectively tame it uh, and therefore make it manageable. So by, by all means, don't think of this as simplifying IT, but it's really about taming the beast and, and making it work for us. Now, when it comes to uh, virtualization, um, as we've already pointed out, virtualization is great for making better use of what you've already got today. <coughs> But when we actually look beyond it, sometimes the challenges we face are much, much, much more than just making better use of our existing resources. So what happens if we've got an old building and it costs a lot to modify it? That might not be cost effective in terms of then being able to ramp up the next generation of data center services. I, I was going to say, I mean, this dynamic infrastructure, it's a bit of an oxymoron, isn't it, really? The, the idea of taking something that's been put in place to built to last, built to last, IT built to last. There's a, a, a phrase that should never be uttered, and then we're expecting it to, to dance, like uh, you know, to, to be able to do stuff with it that it wasn't designed for. Yeah, absolutely. And part of this issue is, what, what is it, what, if what you've got <coughs> in terms of the physical resources, the actual architecture, the location, the power supply, the networking, what about your environment that you may be butting up against a problem and not able to respond to the business need with the resources you've got. And that's when you need to take a fresh set of eyes to the problem, look beyond the box and look at, well, what can cloud bring us that enables us to approach IT in a brand new way rather than just trying to get use the old way of architecting IT to try and solve this new generation of problems. I was going to ask you about that. So how does virtualization link to cloud, Andy? So, Cloud is much bigger than just virtualization. So virtualization is really about being able to run multiple separate workloads as separate containers on one machine. That's physically what virtualization is. But cloud is so much more. Cloud is about making use of resources wherever and wherever, whenever they may be. Being able to pick it up from one machine, move it to another, having it done automatically. And also having it independent of things like the hypervisor because you don't necessarily want to be tied to, say, a VMware or a Microsoft or a Citrix hypervisor to run your workloads. You may have different needs, maybe even all on the same box or the same mm -hmm. rack, for example. So it's about a much broader approach than purely consolidating and virtualizing workloads. It's very much about almost a complete virtual data center that you're able to move wherever is most cost effective or resource effective to run the workloads. Whereas Virtualization on its own is really just about consolidating many boxes down to far fewer boxes. And how does this, uh, Dr. Phil, if I may, how does this fit in with your experience? I mean, did you, when uh, the virtualization topic started coming up, were you thinking, oh, great, finally, we can start to do stuff more? Uh, when the cloud came up, were you thinking, uh, that's exactly what we needed? Or were you thinking, oh, here they go again, telling us about things that are... Uh, uh, we don't fully. We're not fully able to use. How, how did it map out from the, your 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 side of the fence? I think. I think what what I would I'd, I'd certainly agree that cl cloud is a lot more just than hypervisor and and virtualization. Um, but the one thing that's occurred to me over the last eighteen months as I've become involved in this is looking at the bottom bullet point there definitions are still woolly. Um, I think a really helpful way to to look at cloud uh, is to is, is to distinguish, but make it a cloud of two halves. And in one half of the cloud, you you, you have um, infrastructure as a service, um, cloud services at the in infrastructure level, which might be at the hypervisor level, it might be at the the raw tin level. We'll we'll look at that later. Now that has the potential to become a true commodity if you put the right distribution network in place, you could have suppliers competing equally to a set of defined standards, fighting hard with each other to give me, the customer, the best deal. Um, so that's one half of the cloud, and that's mm -hmm. the half I'm, I'm very interested in. I'm also pretty interested in the other half of the cloud, which is platform as a service, software as a service, but that involves proprietary standards, vendor uh, uh, lock-in. Uh, once I've signed up to a, a software as a service, my exit strategy becomes 
um, less clear. The supplier doesn't work as, as, have to work as hard to keep my business, and maybe I don't get the, the best deal. I think there's still benefits uh, there. Um, but, yeah, looking at that bottom bullet point, definition still will I think sometimes suppliers are quite happy to jumble those two things up. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I think uh, we've kind of done ourselves a disservice as an industry. I, I always say that cloud... Um, I don't think customers are confused. It's the industry that's confused because we, it, firstly, we've struggled to define it, and then everybody wants it defined in their own image. Um, and I think I think that the the, the virtualization push has been a fantastic movement because I think it's forced the discussion around consolidation and not running silos of infrastructure, silos of technologies. Um, but we've then kind of said, well, that's great, but virtualization kind of, as, as we've said, solves kind of fixing a bit the bits of what we got. But again, that fixes half of what we've got. And I, it's. <laughs> Was, we'll, we'll run out of analogies today, by the way, because you're always doing cloud discussions and, 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 and metaphors, but um, it's kind of like getting an aeronautical engineer and an air stewardess together to discuss the future of aviation. Um, very different viewpoints of it. One is building the things, but, but actually that's how we kind of see cloud today, from the, the service that goes on the plane through to the design. And I think cloud is kind of all of those things. You look at this slide, it's kind of all of those things. But, but Phil, you said your first priority is really... It's almost a resource priority. It's about making those resources, infrastructure resources, as efficient as possible. Yes. And the, the second priority is about then the services that can be built on top of it, which you might suffer from the lock-in or, or whatever. Yeah. The, the, the bit that I was surprised, going back to, 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 to the, the, the readership, is, is, is on the, the viewpoint, is there was, there was really no talk there of management, of automation, of operation of data centres, because I think that kind of... I think what people are actually saying there is we're going to run our data centres better and you know some of the things I think Phil will talk about in terms of automation and orchestration of services is, is, and service catalogues is kind of where we're trying to get to with this. Well, that, that is absolutely fundamental, yeah, and I think we, we will touch on that later. Yeah. But the readership, again, comes back and says management is a problem most yeah, of absolutely. the time, and it's, yeah. it's actually taming the complexity of technology to produce a cloud is all about orchestration and, and management and is the, the single most important thing to make this yeah. work long term. So, might, um, might that be because the readership just isn't there yet as well? Um, some yeah. are there and some have some way to go. I, I, but I don't think the industry is there either. You're not going to yeah. best one in the world. No hypervisor vendor is going to say our biggest problem is managing our solution. Either. So I think that's the wider discussion. That's one. For me... For me, it's, it's, it's enabling the consumer as well of IT. And I, I think, uh, agreeing with Chris, you know, that, that as an industry, we haven't done that in the past. We haven't fully enabled the consumer or put our focus on the consumer of the IT and enabling them and enabling the business. Too much we've focused on IT as a function, you know, and not on the guys that need to consume it, the business and the application owners. I think, you know, cloud has the, and, and the tools around it have the, the you know, the... the well, let's, let's, um, and, and just a point there as well is actually one of the important things is, for example, the, the self-service or the service-centred viewpoint. Yeah. And it can actually be an advantage because quite often if you're just providing IT services on a siloed basis, you often over-architect to get things like reliability in. Yeah. But once it becomes something that the business unit is actually having to pay for directly and they can see it, for example, re re resiliency and recoverability, sometimes they say, well, actually, we don't need 99.99% with uh, platinum support. We can actually do with 99.8% with a bronze level of support for that, that service. So sometimes it can actually turn IT provisioning and service on its head and make it better to deliver because it's, it's actually meeting the realistic expectations. Well, let's pick up on the, the word that's in the middle of this, which is, which is hybrid. It's about bringing everything together. And, and, and let's turn to you, Lawrence. Um, I noticed that that word is also on, on the next slide. So uh, how, how do you yeah. think that, that, that we should be bringing everything together? Um, OK, from, from, from the point of view of as, uh, us as a vendor, NetApp as a vendor, um, what do we see? Uh, we've spoken about siloed IT ar architecture, and I see many customers that still sit in that space and are looking to virtualise but, you know, are not enabling the business, as we've just spoken about. Um, they, they're not focused on the consumer. And I see those customers also that have virtualized that are then looking to make the next step and then trying to find the route to or from transitioning from virtualization to cloud. And it's that that I hear you know, a lot of discovery around that. You know, what can vendors offer me from a storage provider's point of view? What can you, how can you enable me to consume my compute and my storage you know, through a single pane of glass, you know, gold, silver, as you, as you describe it, the metals, platinum, gold, silver, bronze, 
And then what, so that onto the hybrid piece is then, mm. well, what, what do I need, what are my crown jewels? What do I need to do internally that might be my, my internal cloud, yeah, my private cloud? Mm. What could I actually offload externally? And, and how, what the flexibility could that, that hybrid model but give me? Talk Which, us through, the, and, talk and us through this, because at one end we've got the siloed kind yes, of thing, and at the other end yes. we've got it all up in the stars yeah. almost. Um, so so, so what where's the spectrum? We've tried, what we're trying to do as a vendor is, you know, is focus on the transition piece between the virtualization and then getting to a cloud infrastructure. So it is back to, um, again, we're trying to put our focus on the consumer of IT, and it is giving them the tools that enable them you know, to, to enable IT to, to actually define what policies the organisation, how they want to provision, how they want to enable self-service, the definition of that service, what goes into the service catalogue, if you like. And not only that, and we were talking about this in the green room actually, you know, if, you, if you're going to provide this enablement for the consumer, the analytics that go alongside that, how are you going to provide some sort of mechanism, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, as it was always you mm -hmm. know, a mantra we often hear. Uh, the tools that go alongside that self-service provisioning type model based on sets of policies um, is absolutely key. Things like chargeback, we were talking about earlier, you know, you know a chargeback model, absolutely key. So, so we're focused on sort of that, that, that enabling, not only the private, the public, but that, that hybrid model, and then well, you know, it's for the for their customer, uh, trying to form the customer's view of what what needs to sit where within the cloud, but providing the flexibility, quality of service, as you said, flexibility of how data moves within the cloud, reliability, redundancy within the cloud as well. So within our storage arrays, you know, data moves with the, with the app with the, the virtual so machine. So you've got to enable that flexibility. Yeah, we have to enable that flexibility and 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 also drive the efficiency behind it as well. That is absolutely key for us. Yeah, and one of the, the things that we get a lot of feedback on is it's not about moving the whole data center to the cloud. It's, it's about starting with a realistic expectation and often even with the what we'd call the less critical workloads because they're the ones that can tolerate the occasional failure as you get up to speed. So don't try and make your cloud about moving the most critical performance sensitive or the most horrible to license applications onto the private cloud, but actually get the workloads that are actually consuming a lot of man time to manage, but that are not very critical. Consolidate them down, put them in a private cloud and grow from there as experience grows. The, the, uh, the, the way I would say about that is, and I think this is, I'll probably get onto this in a second, is, is there is a perception that cloud is this risky, uh, dangerous kind of wild west to, to, to live in. Um, and, I, and, and, and we should just move non-critical workloads out there. Um, and, and, and I would argue you, you could be right if, if, you're, if you see cloud as a hotel room for the night. Um, you're probably not going to go and take all your family jewels there and, and, and every time you go. But I think, I think we, we need to move as an industry also to the fact that cloud kind of needs to grow up in terms of, I, I would argue, probably most hosted clouds are better run than the average internal IT infrastructure. So it might be a controversial point for the readership, but you, you, go to an, you go to a cloud data center, you look at the infrastructure that's been built, the amount of money that's been spent, the operational uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 overhead that, that, is, that is delivered by the provider, it's probably better run than the majority of internal IT infrastructures out there, especially in the mid-size organization. So I think, again, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting debate to be had that if we're going to continue looking at the cloud as, as the kind of the... The, the 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 riskiest place to put your IT, then I think I think users will be will be concerned about it. So. Well, there's a question for the users, uh, a, a challenge almost uh, about uh, whether or not uh, the cloud is better at managing your data than uh, than uh, <coughs> yourselves. So, any feedback you have on that? Any questions? We've got a couple of questions that come in or have come in already that have both tended to be around this uh, this uh, idea of uh, migration, of, of, of data movement, and so on and so forth. So we'll, we'll see whether or not they get picked up as we go along, um, as we start to go into the specifics of the, of the case. And so uh, uh, I, this is between, uh, between uh, you, Chris, and, and Phil, introducing us to, to what's really going on at uh, Loughborough University. Yeah, no, I, I, I was going to... Kind of introduced uh, the, the, my slide by the, by the last point is is I, one of the, th the the journey that I think Phil's going to describe I think is an interesting one because it wasn't a virtualization kind of journey it wasn't about um, uh, uh, you know trying to look at the cloud as this um, 
fly-by-night place to be. It was, it was really some, some big infrastructure problems and some, some future view of how do you deliver I, I, ICT. And I, and I think going back to the point of <laughs> the, the, the reason I think Phil felt reasonably confident about the cloud is it wasn't just somewhere out there. You could visit it, you could touch it. I mean, if you look at our business in the UK, the last 18 months we've spent around £12.5 million pounds, um, in infrastructure to support cloud services. Um, and, you know... You, you, you know, you can build clouds on cheap white boxes, you know, and, and, and somewhere out there in the world. But I think there's a lot more investment going on in the UK than I think users are aware of, uh, and organisations are aware of that cloud is built on enterprise-grade technology. It's running very well-run data centres. You know, when you speak to a cloud provider, as we have with Phil, you, where's your SLA? You, 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 you know, you don't want to just say, well, I'll kind of make it work. You want an SLA, and I think. The, the journey that Phil had was, and, and it was the most interesting tender I've ever responded to in a dialogue I've ever had, because literally it was a one-page introduction that said, I've got a 20-year-old data centre to discuss. Now, as an industry, we manage an 800-page response to that, because that's the kind of thing we do. But that was, that was Phil's thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, that, that unless we as an industry start to, to build and invest, we won't be able to answer those questions. That, Phil's, that, that, that people like Phil and, and, and Loughborough and other universities and outside of the sector will start to ask us. And so I, think, again, I think as we start to move on, I, this is a very important area, which is whether or not uh, someone comes to you with a challenge of, I have a, a very old infrastructure, or whether they're coming to you with, is there anything I can do without throwing everything away or you know, um, without having that option? Yeah. And I, was, I, was, I, I think the, the kind of two camps. Um, I think the, the, the compelling events are the old infrastructure, um, but I think a lot of people are are saying, look, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll use the cloud, but I don't want to change a lot. How can I migrate into it? How can I leverage? And I think, you know, our cloud is built on NetApp storage. Why? Because a lot of end users use NetApp storage, and they can see the migration onto the similar platform as being incredibly de-risked because mm -hmm. they're not going from, you know, we've set tenders in the industry for the last 30 years have specified everything down to the last widget and byte. We're not just going to go, we don't care anymore, give us a service. And I think that's that migration as well, which is, again, I think the dialogue that, that we've had with Loughborough and, and other, uh, other organisations. So let's look at some of the specifics of yeah. uh, Loughborough University, shall we? Okay. Shall we? Thanks. Right. <laughs> so, specifically, what's the um, problem that Loughborough University was trying to solve? Um, we've seen from a couple of questions, there are other people from uh, the higher education sector who are obviously watching this, so good morning to people who, who've asked questions. Um, there might also be other organisations where research is and knowledge creation is an important function that will recognise some of these issues. There'll also be people watching this, perhaps you know, work in banking or something like that, will think, what on earth is, what on earth is this about? Um, you know, I'm sorry if it's not relevant to you, but this is my business, this is the context that I work in. Um, you know, I hope it's of interest, but uh, in any case, it's, it's what it is. Um, so like, an, like rather a lot of research-intensive universities, um, Loughborough has a problem that, that it's got a data centre that was built in the early 70s, um, funded by the, the then Computer Board, a central um, government agency. Um, it's now reached the end of its useful life. Uh, it has a power utilisation PUE rating of about 2.3. Carbon targets obviously weren't, weren't an issue in the early 1970s. So what are we going to do about this legacy data centre that's the end of its, its life? We also have a, se a, a separate but, but, but related problem that, that a lot of research-intensive universities will, will recognise, I think, um, and that is that research... Research, knowledge creation, it needs very agile responses. Niches for research come up, they have to be addressed very quickly. It's a competitive area. If you don't do it, someone else will get in there. And sometimes research groups don't feel that central computing services are agile enough or responsive enough to, 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 to their needs. And as a result, we see um, what, what I've called DUDs, distributed data centres under desks, springing up in, in, in research areas. Now, these do have a benefit. Uh, you know, the, the benefit is they are agile. They do respond to the immediate needs of, of, of research groups. But there are obvious risks as well. They're not very green. Um, and just in, you know, there could be six months a year of really valuable research in in one of those duds, and it might not be backed up properly, and all of that work could get lost. And one does hear stories of such things um, happening. So that, that 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 gives you a bit of a a bit of background for where I'm I'm coming from. Uh, I think that uh, that will be a very familiar scenario <coughs> in the financial sector as well. Okay, well, by the way. So. I've only ever worked in higher education, so I, I'm interested to hear that. But I'm, I'm sure you're right. So I think we had. Essentially, three 
options for how we try and solve this, this problem. And when we went out to, to tender, we really were open about uh, yeah, how absolutely. we... How, we, d we had, didn't have any strong uh, preconceptions. So I guess the first option would be a like-for-like -like, uh, refurbishment of the data centre, something that will see us through for the next, 40, the next 40 years. How do we predict our requirements for the next 40 years? Well, well I don't know. That's so that makes it difficult to start off. OK, so we'll have a guess. We know it has to be very green, so whatever we do, it probably needs to be about the same size, 50 or 60 racks. Do we need that? Well, if we do, we've got to make it really green um, because of the carbon emissions targets. You're looking at one, two, two and a half million pounds to do a like-for-like -like, uh, refurbishment. So, um, anyway, that's one option. It's got to, before you spend, that's be just on building mechanical electrical before you spend a single penny on uh, service and storage. So that's certainly an option, um, but it required a large up upfront spend and, and we were interested in other options. So I guess at the other end of the spectrum, there's uh, full external uh, hosting either you, you know via cloud services or via uh, just just private hosting arrangements. Um, again, we, we probed that. We saw that the costs um, could become comparable with the uh, like for like refurbishment. There's also a risk in that once you've put your stuff out in that way, you don't have as clear an exit strategy. Um, that's a risk that a number of organisations are quite happy to take, but universities, public sector, traditionally a bit risk averse. Um, that's something that, 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 that senior managers might not be comfortable about, about doing. Um, so we toyed around with those. We went through this competitive dialogue process, this, this OG competitive dialogue, um, and what we ended up with was a middle way, uh, a hybrid approach. Um, and the strategy was quite simple. Um, locally, don't spend any more. <laughs> don't spend any more locally than you need to to get you through the um, the next few years, um, and then look to architect what you do locally in a way that makes it as easy as possible to join up and integrate with emerging um, cloud services. We can't predict exactly where we're going to be in three or four years' time, so let's keep it as as agile as, as possible. And I was I was quite amused to read the, the the sort of billing on your website about you know Loughborough University didn't have cash swilling around, I think was the phrase <laughs> used to, to, to spend on refurbishing a, a, a like for like data. Actually, Loughborough University's financial position is very sound. If we really wanted to spend two and a half million pounds on a, on, on a data centre, we could. But w once we saw there was an alternative, uh, everyone I spoke to said, no, we'd rather spend the two and a half million pounds on research and teaching, yes, because that's our core business. This is priorities, isn't it? Um, and uh, that, so... Um, so students, if you're out there, don't worry. <laughs> Loughborough University is in a very sound position. That's, I, I wanted, yeah, the, the director of finance specifically asked me to uh, um, to make that point. Even if they don't have cash swilling around. So um, anyway, the local part, which we've called uh, the local part of our, our hybrid cloud solution, which we've called a mini pod, um, we've spent the absolute minimum on. Uh, building mechanical and electrical costs. In, 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 in this case, you're looking at a picture of a mini pod um, that's in a roof void, which wasn't it was space that wasn't useful for any other purpose. Um, and rather than two and a half million pounds, the building cost there was actually twenty thousand pounds. So just to give you an idea, um, inside that you have a um, an APC enclosed um, hot aisle, cold aisle with with an external water chiller. It gives a fairly green PUE rating of around about 1.5, certainly a heck of a lot better than the 2.3 of our 70s data centre. Not again, we could have spent the extra two million quid, really driven that PUE down, but we made a value. Can you um, just uh, for for anyone out there, including me, um, uh, that doesn't fully understand PUE, is this uh, uh, 2.3 is bad, 1.5 is better. What, what's 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 perfect PUE? One. Yeah? One and, so. uh, and then there's platinum rating, which I think is between one and one point two, and typically to to reach that you have to build a very large data centre, the kind that um, HP have built one in Windlesham. So we're aiming for unity on the that's PUA. perfection. That's right. theoretical okay. perfection. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, shall, let's have a look at what it looks like inside, shall we? Well, I just had a, a quick question for Dr. Phil, which is uh, when when you were looking at the workloads, how, were you buying these pods for handling some of your peak workloads, or did you specifically do it to handle just general case and then look to overspill wherever possible? Okay, the specific answer to that question is that, um, I mean, I don't want to give all of my competitive tips away, but <laughs> the competitive dialogue process is great because you're getting advice from, we, we ended up with four shortlisted 
um, companies. Logicalis, obviously, who eventually won the, won the process, and three other, three other big players. Okay? Now, they're, they're giving advice in a competitive context. What we, what we were able to do is actually say to them right at the start of the process, OK, we're going to... The usual route of this, if you're doing a standard virtualization project, you do some kind of tender, you appoint your preferred supplier, they've given you some kind of price. Then you commission a, capacity evalu a formal capacity evaluation. Then the vendor comes back and says, oh, we didn't know you wanted to run that. Oh, that's going to cost you, mate. And the, the competition's over, you're over a barrel. Um, we actually did it the other way around. Right at the very early in the dialogue, we said to the vendors, look... We want to run the capacity evaluation up front. We want to ask a neutral third party to conduct it. We want you to give us costed architected designs against our measured requirements and with a growth model for the next two or three years, which we established in the, uh, in the tender process. And will you do it? And they said, oh, we don't usually do it like that. We don't usually... Well, you know, you, if you want to drop out of the competition, that's fine. So because we maintained the competition, we got all four vendors to sign up for that. We commissioned VMware Professional Services to do that capacity evaluation. Loughborough University is definitely, officially, the smallest organisation that VMware Professional Services has ever dealt with. They obviously deal with big uh, integrators and resellers as a rule, but they were happy to do it in this particular case, and it, it, it gave us a much better basis to ask people to design and specify uh, uh, their and, solutions. And, and as one of those uh, suppliers and, and, and through that process was, was, was going back to your point of, of the consumer, is it wasn't just the IT team, it was faculty, it was... It was I mean, I remember about 25 people being in one of the, 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 the meetings from all across the university, from the guys who were, were existing, running the existing data centre. And, and interestingly, going back to those, the duds under desks, um, it was kind of the faculty that were kind of saying, well, if you, can, if you can do something for me that allows me to kind of continue my operational model, it's like we call them containers of chaos in the end, but we, we, we want a lump of something that's well run that we can kind of do what we want with that's part of a bigger platform, we really will buy into this. So I, I think that, that dialogue and getting the users involved, the operational guys involved, the chief operating officer involved, the finance guys involved, was a true test of kind of the cloud model because it wasn't just the IT industry thinking what we could do with it. It was, it was a rounded dialogue with the whole university. And I think that for us was a fascinating kind of uh, 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 discussion that we had with the university to get to the point, obviously, when we, when we delivered something. So uh, I've got one question that's come up. Uh, well, we've got, we've got many questions that have come up, so thank you very much, but keep them coming. But uh, it's specifically this one around uh, cost savings uh, and in, in terms of flexibility, agility, and so on and so forth, um, I, I think to, to, to your point, Phil, around you've, you've worked in academia, you know the kind of um, uh, maths, if you like, that you've been able to apply in this. But do, does that... Uh, do those calculations, does the business case, does the ROI carry over to, to other smaller businesses that aren't in the academic sense? Uh, um, I mean, we were in a position where something had to be done or our 70s data centre would literally collapse and the, and the university would grind to a halt. So, you know, that's the, maybe that's not a great position to, to get into, but that's, uh, you, you know, that's where we were. Um, what the... I mean, it might be easy to pick this... I'll, I'll build on this later, but essentially, as part of the hybrid cloud, we've, we've got the local capacity, and we retain, um, long term, we retain local capacity. It gives us our exit strategy, but it also gives us a baseline. We know how much it costs um, to run stuff on, on the local part of the cloud, and we can use that to compare the cost of, of running services remotely. And at the point where it clearly becomes cheaper, like for like, to place stuff remotely, that's when we're going to start doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, a good, an interesting question is, is that point today? Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll come back to that later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And how about some of the, the other things maybe around looking at where you run your workloads? Because we often get, as part of the surveys we do, um, concerns about where data is located, particularly if then you're looking at personal information. Is that an issue for you and how, yeah. how have you dealt with it if it has been? Um, I've, okay, I, I, I mean, again, it'll be easy to pick, pick this up later, but the, the hybrid approach allows one to choose particular... There are different perceived risks, and I think senior management's perception of risk may actually be different from the, from the true risk. But they're the senior managers. It's their name that's on the ticket. And so, you, you know, you've got to go with their, their judgment. And so there are, senior managers have perceived risks about different services. Um, therefore, lower-risk services are the ones you, you would want to push out first. But over time, I think um, everyone will realise the world doesn't stop 
spinning on its axis when you push critical things out to well-managed cloud services. And, you know, senior managers over time will see that and be, will just begin to feel more comfortable about it. Yeah, I'm just going to go back to the point of, of, of is it cheaper for, for, you know, is the cost savings kind of large to small? I, I think the one thing that, that, that end users do need to just really consider is... is you need to run your your internal IT as, as well as you can. Yeah, and I think there are some software as a service. Going to go back to our initial debate: hardware as a service, software as a service. The whole cloud pitch is, you know, kind of setting up. If you're a small business, setting up your own email infrastructure now, I, I think you'd have to be crazy. I mean, you would you would just go uh, software as a service. There's plenty of crazy people out. There. Oh yeah, yeah. But, but I'm just saying, I, I, I think that would be a really good kind of, you know, I think that's an obvious kind of place to look and, and, and weigh the, 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 the odds. I think the challenge with kind of some of the infrastructure clouds, and somebody's asked a question about the mega hosters. Um, is, you know, if you can't afford to kind of run your own house, it's kind of cheaper to move into a hotel for a week or two, but you couldn't afford to live there, mm. yeah? Um, and I think some of those kind of mega hosters look at the cloud as that night in a hotel or that test dev. They started with, you know, provisioning of VMware for, for a few hours, spot, spot pricing, bid, you know, cloud bid up TV kind of stuff where you can bid for... I think for long-term capacity you could actually get yourself into a very expensive situation unless you really do the numbers over the lifetime of, of the on-site versus the cloud or the hybrid model is to understand what the real cost of ownership is going to be. Because I think you know, we've, we've priced some of those mega, um, those mega cloud providers for long-term capacity and actually it's kind of double of, 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 of even buying the whole, including your burst, running it yourself for that period of time. So I think there is definitely an ROI that, that, that organisations need to look at and really understand the cost models because you 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 can move to a hotel and find it really ex really cheap for the first night, but again a year um, in you could be you could be really and of course yeah. we've got to beware some of the hidden gotchas as we go forward because connectivity for example today is flat rate there's plenty about but what happens if the, the ISP networks start to get overloaded as we make more use of cloud and what was internal data centre traffic now swamps the the ISP networks, and you then have to pay more for quality of service, then connectivity is not free. The economics of cloud do change. So we have to be aware of these facts, and therefore having a flexible hybrid approach is often the most pragmatic one because you have an exit strategy. You can run internally if it makes better cost sense, or you can run it externally if it, if it in that case, makes sense as well. I just want to pick up on a, a few, um, because we've, we've kind of been debating around, around a lot of these subjects, but the, one, one area that we haven't necessarily covered completely on, on this slide it, is, is around security and that whole, um, that whole aspect. So it's not just a privacy aspect, but it is genuine risk management. Do you want to pick up on that, Lawrence? It's well, yeah, yeah, uh, very important question. I mean, from our point of view, um, we, we, when you're building out clouds, um, our, our, our approach is to start to unify, unify your workloads, bring them together, um, and drive those, that efficiency and the flexibility up. And of course, the question I often get asked, yes, but I don't want to run my test dev workload alongside my finance and HR workloads. You know, I need you to provide me with the assurance that there is brick wall security between, you know, where I can divide my workloads up, I can provide the quality of service I need to but you know, you've got to give me assurance throughout the stack, top to bottom, application to storage, that I have got security. So we, we introduced the concept of, um, well, secure multi-tenancy, SMT it is, through the stack so that you can do that. You can start to build out cloud-capable infrastructure and also apply security within that. And not only that, the tools to do things, so if you're, if you're a legal organisation and you need to provide things like worm capability, so be able to snap, to lock things like copies of data as well. And to, your, to, the, to the point previously around about efficiencies, to try and drive that in whole efficiency model. We, we in this industry, are, we love making copies of stuff. I mean, how many copies did we make, make of versions of, did we make of the presentation before we got the final one? And I'll bet you we've got... How many versions of that They're stored on stored. our laptops? They're all stored. But <laughs> well, we were having that discussion earlier about <laughs> it, it's no use having efficient storage it's if no you make use. no use of it. Absolutely. It's about making value yes. Um, yes. judgments and yeah. paying really for the stuff yes. you need to a use. Absolutely. So, I mean, there are some, some excellent tools now for actually driving that efficiency while keeping the number of copies that you want to keep, but only keeping one physical copy of it on, online. You know, you, you, you can do some really neat things, a lot of customers do that, things like backups online or usable clones that they want to put out in amongst the test dev community, but 
security keys. Secure multi-tenancy is, is the buzzword there that I would, I would yeah, ask everyone so, to focus yeah. on and to go out and sort of investigate. Yeah. So is, is that enabled really through encryption and um, being able to set up really sort of really encrypted, isolated I partitions? Isolated partitions with, with it through the stack though, from the virtualization at the compute level through to the storage. Yeah. And not only that, to actually get that verified externally by the penetration firms out there that will do the work in, in and actually giving you the report back that says, yes, we've been in, we've acted as the admin, and we've tried to do X, Y, Z, and we could not penetrate it. So, so we've been very focused on that, especially with FlexPod, and I think we were going to talk about that fairly shortly. And it, you know, In the design of FlexPod, secure multi-tenancy, penetration testing, the ability to lock, create worm copies for legal purposes, to be able to move data, to, to have data motion within the network, to be able to move virtual machines plus their data where you need them, so y you achieve that, that additional level of abstraction, if you like, that virtualization provides um, within the network. So that, that's been key in the design of FlexPod, which we, which we brought to market two years ago, um, really to sort of start to address this, this need for cloud infrastructure and, and the fact that customers, you know, customers it, building, out, building these things out yourself, if you're going to do it your, yourself, the, the, doing all the what works with what bit, as I like to call it, you know, can take months. You know, we've, I've, in my youth, that's what I used to, to do with my day job. You know, it was six months of... Does this compute platform or this application work with the compute, work with the network, which are my HBAs, my firmware? Oh. A lot of us haven't got the time for that anymore. So we really wanted to come to market and provide a flexible, at each layer, so compute flexible, network flexible, storage flexible architecture that was sort of cloud ready. And indeed, that's, that's what Logicalis adopted and indeed what um, Loughborough so University have. Let, let's move things on then. So we, we've, got, we've got the FlexPod, we've got a, we, the business case is there, but uh, one topic that came up earlier was, was around management and, and uh, once it's all in place, how, how do you actually manage the thing? So Andy, to you, I mean, what, what are the challenges here? Well, the challenges that we see are that many companies don't actually invest enough in management and what they do tend to find is that their operations staff are overstretched and offer firefighting. They don't have a way to really patch and maintain servers so they're up to date and secure and they find it difficult to reconfigure and, response and respond to business requests for change. And that is really, if you're in that situation, just trying to implement a cloud is not going to work. It requires an integrated management approach right from the storage through the network, through compute, all the way through to applications. And what, it, what we're really after is a way to integrate all the different silos so that you can get an end-to-end -end service and then to make it not, not a human function. What we want to do is really make it automated as much as possible so we have a policy, we can click a button, it does the change, it's up and running, it's effective, it's tested um, and it's put into place and works. But just as important is the ability to do things like test that it does work and roll it back if there's an issue. So and we have, we have seen, for example, in a number of high-profile cases that outages have occurred after fairly minor changes that the impact was detected maybe a little too far along and they couldn't roll it, roll it out. So that's something we expect to see improving over time. Cloud's so just, not perfect Just yet. having virtualization or cloud or both or uh, the hybrid model, they don't automatically solve your management problems. No, and, no. and, and also I was going to say that, that, that we concentrate on all the layers of management from the infrastructure all the way through to the service catalogue for the users. And I think, you know, we say, if people have all, you know, if kind of the management's kind of cut before the horse because I think we'd be, you know, I think we're trying to manage the whole infrastructure as a service and I think that's where the management, and I think we, we've done a lot of work with people like CA uh, around automation, orchestration, service catalogues, and I think that that's actually one of the things that's coming along really quickly. It's probably only a person that's a kind of mid to large organisations. I don't think small organisations are going to try and automate and orchestrate IT operations because they, d they don't need to. But I think that mid to large, that's, I think, a real focus area for the next 12, 18 months is, is really kind of beefing up the management strategy. Yeah, but what, what even then what we see is management is still important to small business. Oh, but who, pr yeah. who provides yeah, yeah, it? It's often, say, a reseller or integrator who's then using the tools oh, to do yeah, so. Yeah, so it's, it's a matter of who, who applies it. But 
it, it's absolutely critical. Orchestration is becoming a, a key word in enabling the cloud. Everything has to work, and you need a conductor just to wave the baton to have it all happen. You don't want the conductor running around playing all the parts. Right, so um, we'd love to spend more time on management because it's, it's a fantastic topic, but uh, I think uh, we're going to have to move into the specifics of, of what happened at Loughborough. So I'm going to hand it back to you, Phil. OK, well, I mean, just to summarise what we've said so far, we started off with our legacy um, 1970s data centre um, and we've described the fairly green uh, local part of our hybrid solution, um, the two... Um, mini pods that we have for, for, for resilience, uh, and now I'd like to look a bit in a bit more detail at, at the um, what, what the remote part of the the hybrid is. So, first of all, the the, the the specific choice we made as part of our competitive dialogue process was to go with the Logicalis cooperative cloud model. Um, the thing that the particular thing that impressed us was that rather than having a theoretical account given to us, we were able to go to Slough, we were able to go and see this working. Um, we, were, we were also reassured that our local cloud uses exactly the same reference architecture as the remote cloud. We, we were given in confidence details of other customers who use your facilities in Slough. They're high-profile customers. You've got to get it work, working for them, so you're going to get it working for us both remotely and, and locally. So that, frankly, was, an, that was quite a, um, an, an important part of the... So some people process. can build data centres in Slough that work. <laughs> data it's good to know. Uh, a, a quick point on what Phil's at, and it's a kind of trivial point. Uh, it might sound trivial, but there are very few cloud, cloud, you know, hybrid cloud isn't key. That it's either in all in our data centre or all in yours. This hybrid model, and I think our ability to work both on site and in the data centre is actually, I think, quite an interesting model for the channel anyway, for, for the systems integrators, for the providers, is if you're going to build the cloud on site, and integrate it with a hosted cloud, being able to actually own both pieces and advise on both pieces, I think is going to be really important as we kind of go forward as well. So just to kind of add that to Phil's point. Um, VMware is part of that, but the solution we've got is, is, is a lot more than just, just hypervisors, as we've, as we've heard already. Um, also, software as a service, platform as a service. We have moved our uh, infrastructure for student um, email, calendaring, and documentation onto the... Uh, on, onto the Google Cloud. And again, students are very important to Loughborough. Loughborough University ha it, it consistently wins the best student experience, but in, in senior managers' minds, uh, student services was, was a good place to start in terms of pushing stuff out to the, uh, you know, to the, pub to the public cloud. Um, but underpinning all this of the foundation is the um, Janet Network. Um, and this is, this is really very important. I would like to, to spend a bit of time before you do, uh, and uh, um, I did say we'd be bringing up questions as we went along, uh, someone has actually asked uh, a very specific question about Janet, so maybe if I ask the question, and yeah. then you can uh, feed this into the answer. The most common cloud-related question which comes up in my institution relates to the use of Janet, slower bandwidth, to drop off and pick up data, rather than the much faster local network. Is this an issue? If so, how is it managed? And is it a real limitation on cloud solutions? Right, so... Feed that in. This, was that from Raymond Scott? Uh, Raymond, thanks very much for your question. I'm glad I'll, I'll, I'll catch up with you afterwards as well. But uh, <laughs> the, oh. the answer is that, yeah, Janet does, does provide a constraint, but it's so much... It's so much better than the, the commercial internet. So let me just give you a couple of quick anecdotes, right? First of all, when we migrated our, um, our student email service from an in-house service to the Google Cloud, we had two terabytes of data. We talked to a few people in Google informally. They said, well, are you going to push that via, via the network, via Janet? You know, it might take a while, allow up to a week um, to do that. In the event, we were able to... Um, synchronize our, our student email data, two terabytes, in, in less than 24 hours via the Janet network. So uh, whilst that, that's not as good as one can achieve on one's LAN, um, it, was, it was the biggest, all sorts of security alarms went off in Google. They thought they were being hacked a few times because of the huge ingress of, of data from the Janet network from Loughborough, from Loughborough University. So we, we, we did something that they, their, their cloud hadn't, hadn't seen before. And let's give you another example. If you're transferring data to Amazon, to their cloud services, uh, EC2 S3, the cheapest and quickest way to transfer large amounts of data is to put your data onto a portable drive and send it via courier. 
Now, the thing about Janet, its growth model is predicated on world-class research. Um, you know, you're saying I was a doctor, and actually I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a doctor it's actually in nuclear physics, and I've done work in, in, in CERN. And just imagine you're a CERN physicist. You, you're running your large hadron collider. I often imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> you've, seen, <laughs> you've seen some results, some interesting-looking results that, that could prove the existence of the Higgs boson. You're itching to find out what... what what, to, to analyse them properly on your grid. But the first thing you have to do is put, put all the results on a portable hard drive and send it via courier to Dublin to Amazon's data centre. And then you can start analysing yourself. No, that's not how, that's not how world-class research works. Okay? It might be how Amazon's cloud works. It's not how, it's not how particle physics in, in CERN works. So it's not exactly Janet, Asimov, is it? We're not talking. When you've got, <laughs> when you've got that... Um, when, when you've got that backbone, that... that, that that has capacity to deal with this huge amount of research data, then layering some cloud services on top of it is, is feasible. Now, Janet are currently specifying the, the new Janet 6 network, and they're looking at a 100 gigabit um, backbone, which will, to meet uh, research needs, but also increasingly to um, meet cloud, cloud needs via, via the Janet brokerage. Um, and so, really, looking ahead, I think Janet is going to be very important. It's important that, to, to uh, Raymond Scott, it's not just the bandwidth of, of Janet, but it's the availability as well. Your, da your local data centre will probably be connected to the core of your network without any s single points of failure. And by extension, if you're having remote data centres via Janet, you need to have dual, resilient, fast connections into the Janet network so that there are no single points of failure between your users and your um, remote data centre capacity. Um, so it's both the, sp the speed and the uh, availability, the resilience, the latency. Again, from a technical point of view, Janet is a very low latency network, and, and to deliver true infrastructure services yeah. from the cloud, you need, you need a very low latency network. So Janet really does have the potential to be our national grid for, for cloud, and universities and, and colleges as well are in a great position compared to, 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 to other companies that are only connected via the commercial internet and have to send portable disks via, um, via couriers and, and the like. So yes, Janet do, does need to uh, extend its capacity. Um, it, it has ambitious plans to do that. Um, and what we also need as part of the Janet brokerage is these very large services such as Amazon to peer straight into Janet. So if we could persuade Amazon, rather than connecting through the commercial internet, to have a very fast pipe via HENA in Dublin um, to, the, to, to the Janet core, uh, a, they could waive their, their, the part of their storage charges that relate to data ingress and egress. And B, we could actually have the capacity so that we wouldn't have to send silly hard disks through the, through, through the post to them. Well, I think Amazon's probably already <laughs> responding to that by abolishing a lot of their upload charges for data. So that, that's already starting to happen. But I think having a choice of connectivity is definitely yeah. key. And in fact, our research shows that for companies that have actually gone down the cloud route already, that... The, the connectivity is actually boosted in importance up to the level of, say, the application server because it's such a critical enabler. Yeah, and therefore, if, if you are thinking about doing cloud seriously, you have to go out and work with an ISP to get the proper service, the proper reliability and uh, quality of service required and not just trust on best effort internet. No, no, and, 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 and zero of our customers in, in, in our cloud use the internet for access. It's all either private-wise, it's MPLS, or it's, or it's, it's extending into Janet. So... Mm -hmm. But each university doesn't want to have to make its own Correct. private Absolutely. connections. Absolutely to, you know, if you've got this national grid, you can have the genuine utility model that I was referring to uh, earlier. And having these big uh, IT providers with their massive data centres, which are run very efficiently, huge economies of scale, have them compete to give me the best possible price for my infrastructure services. So that's what I hope the future holds. But just in case it doesn't, I'm going to retain long-term some <coughs> local capacity uh, as a means of, of, of risk mitigation and, and I know that helps reassure my senior management. S speaking of competition, I've got a couple of questions here, uh, both of which seem to be about the same thing, which is uh, whether Loughborough University actually intends to, uh, to act as a provider to, to other institutions uh, using Janet as, as its own backbone. No, is the, is the <laughs> simple answer to that. Okay, um, I mean, I, because what we're hoping... What I would recommend another university to do is to, to look at provide. And I think this hybrid model is a good one. And if so, if you agree um, in, in the audience, what you want to do is find your own way of keeping your own local capacity, and then hopefully, I, 
the sort of scale we're operating on at Loughborough, if we tried to share that infrastructure, which is yeah. quite small, it would, there would just be no economies of scale. It would be too expensive. You'd have to... It, it wouldn't make sense. It'd be cheaper for you to do that locally uh, uh, yourselves. Uh, and interesting, I, th- I think what, 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 what Phil has done, and, and you know, not, not trying to uh, 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 pat him on the back too much, but kind of Loughborough has led the charge on this in terms of the sector, mm. so without question there's, there's a huge amount of innovation, um, is, is that marketplace for services that Janet's created, and I think things like PSN in the public sector, so we talk about sharing networks, sharing clouds, is, is a great model because it encourages competition. I mean, we extended our... our our, our, our data centre into Janet before the big cloud providers did because we saw that opportunity and that model to work with, uh, with, with Loughborough and we, we kind of see that as a real uh, architectural model going forward as a way of both creating the platforms but also creating the marketplace for those services as well. Yeah, And our recommendation would be again is why look to another university to provide cloud services when someone like a, a Logicalis has built a larger scale data centre with those services or to look at say the broader market as well because there is the Amazons, the Azures etc. So it's, it's go to the specialists in providing multi-tenancy cloud rather than someone who's consuming multi-tenancy so cloud. Let, let's, uh, we're going to have to move well, on. Can I just very quickly, so to distinguish between our model, certainly, we've asked the university's modernisation fund for some money, and if, if we get it, we'll, we'll write this up, we'll promote this to the, the, the sector. But part of the model would be re- to recommend you have your own local capacity, not try and share yeah, absolutely. out. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, tell us about cloud bursting, because this is one way that you are looking to innovate uh, on, on top of the network and uh, using the hybrid model. Okay, so, so, so to, be, to be clear at the moment, we're using the Logicalis Cooperative Cloud as f- for disaster recovery uh, and also for burst capacity. Um, does Loughborough need burst capacity? Maybe, maybe not. Certainly, I think um, U- UCAS needed some uh, burst capacity the day the A-level results came out. So burst capacity is potentially of interest within the, uh, the wider HE sector. Um, but... What we did during July um, was really quite an interesting uh, experiment over Janet, where we moved one of the um, virtual containers within the, the, the Logicalis Cooperative Cloud model, uh, which is a hardware level container. It's not a it's it's, it's yeah, not a hypervisor level container. We moved that and the associated range of IP addresses from Loughborough to Slough via the Janet network. It took about ten minutes. There was some real live production services running on it and then we moved it back again because part of the hybrid cloud is having an exit strategy and being able to move things both ways and we believe that was a genuine national uh, first uh, if somebody if somebody watching uh, disputes that I'd, I'd be very happy to, to stop making that that claim but to, to the very best of my knowledge we think that was a, a national first so it was the first proof of this infrastructure yeah. as a service but cloud bursting via a performance network yeah, like China. And, 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 you know, with, with, without trying to land a man on the moon kind of model, it, is, is this wasn't kind of a hypervisor-based move. This was a physical, physical virtual move of, a, of an environment between two data centres across a, across a public, you know, semi-public network where we literally onboarded onto the cloud in sub-10 minutes mm-hmm. and brought it back again. Um, now... The, the practicality of that is Burst is one of those. DR is a classic. I mean, a lot of people talk about their DR strategies. Cloud is a great opportunity for that. But it's, it's no good if, it, if you have to send a tape in the post. Mm-hmm. Being able to do that in 10 minutes and bring it back in another 10 minutes is a, is a real kind of compelling model for this. One, one thing I do want to cover before we reach the end, uh, any final questions, let us know, uh, is uh, that the, the whole DR aspect and the de-risking because um, uh, concerns uh, exist around doing it as much as what it can do to de-risk, if you like. Yeah. So as we move on to the summary slide, maybe we can answer that, that specific question around uh, what concerns there are around the, the hybrid cloud model and how they can be addressed. Uh, uh, for, 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 from our perspective, I, I, I think that um, we're kind of at this new uh, view of the cloud, which is, uh, and we call it abstraction, is, is if you look at most of the hardware vendors now, they're trying to abstract the function of their infrastructure from the infrastructure itself. So we use NetApp, we use Cisco UCS stateless computing, um, the, I, I think the only concern is every cloud is, is proprietary today because that's where we are, is I think the management, the orchestration, the automation, the abstraction layer is going to start to really move now. And I think what the, 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 the concern we, I think we will get over is, one, is this of security? As Phil said, he had a tool, he, he touched it, he felt it, uh, he knew it existed. Um, we've proved we can move into the cloud and back out again in 10 minutes. So I think all of those kind of things which, which are concern, uh, have, have concerns, I think we're knocking those over. I still think we're in that 1% to 2% of cloud now, and we're going to get gradually bigger and bigger. But I think um, 
I, I think we're at the start of kind of making it real for, for, for customers and users rather than... There was a question earlier on, which is, do we just have to call everything cloud now? If we, <laughs> if we do, we're never going to move forward. So, yes, we yeah. kind of do, but I think, I think we'll get into the, the, the gubbins of it, the real nuts and bolts of it, and start to prove that it's a viable I mean, enterprise solution. Well, one of the things I'm interested in the, in the risk of moving to cloud is some of the gotchas of, say, moving the entire environment to cloud and finding out what Dr. Phil's found in terms of some of the hardware or software well, he's running that isn't really well, amenable and what he's well, looking at to solve I, that. Yeah, and I, sorry, Phil, I, I, think this, I think this is where the hybrid model fits in because Phil's tested it all on his site anyway. So, so the point is, it's all been already tested on a, on a private cloud environment. Therefore, cherry-picking the bits that work well in the other cloud yeah. is a natural... And if it doesn't, but, just pull it back again. Yeah, but exactly. again, it's, it's looking yeah. at, say, some of the infrastructure services, are there databases, etc., that are, are not really licensed or architected to, to run in this area? And is, how, how are you dealing with, say, that type of issue? Um, well, so, final words on the subject <laughs> for me. Uh, final words on the subject. Uh, the, the one issue we've put right to the to the very back of our project is how we deal with our Oracle infrastructure because, um, I don't know, maybe it's their commercial policy, but for whatever reason it seems they make it as hard as possible to, to join that up with anything else. Um, I, I'm not saying I've got all the answers. What I am saying is that we, we've not... Uh, Loughborough hasn't tried to build local capacity and local facilities to cater for the next 40 years in the same way as the computer board got us to do in the 1970s. Instead, we've gone for a more agile, adaptive approach with the hybrid cloud. We don't know which direction we're going to go in. It could go off in us, but we think we're broadly pointing in the right direction. And as this new cloud market emerges, it will be easy for us to make the right choices uh, and move clearly forward in the right direction and, and save some money too. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we'll leave, we'll leave those final words with Phil. Um, and uh, it is all heading in the right direction, but uh, don't come to Loughborough for your uh, cloud services uh, anytime soon. You should be building your own. Uh, one question that did come up uh, about uh, data protection and uh, uh, how do we uh, change our, uh, 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 how we use the cloud if our data prote protection statements prevent us? Well, change them. And uh, uh, if you <laughs> have any other questions uh, or anything that you want to take to the panel, then please let us know. Uh, we will be putting the links up from the, uh, from the, the presenters, uh, will appear on the website uh, over the next day or so. So if you have uh, any uh, uh, desire for further reading, then, then please come to the website and you can get it there. In the meantime, thank you very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed it and look forward to having you tune in next time. Thank you.